Edward Carl Gadel, June 8, 1925 to June 18, 1961, was the smallest player to appear in a Major League Baseball game. Gadel, some sources say the family name may actually have been Gadeel, which is the name seen on his gravestone, gained recognition in the second game of a St. Louis Browns doubleheader on August 19, 1951. Weighing 65 pounds, 29 kilograms, and standing 3 feet 7 inches, 1.09 m, tall, he became the shortest player in the history of the major leagues. Gadel made a single plate appearance and was walked with four consecutive balls before being replaced by a pinch runner at first base. His jersey, bearing the uniform number 18, is displayed in the St. Louis Cardinals Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. St. Louis Browns owner Bill Veek, in his 1962 autobiography Veek, as in rec, said of Gadel, he was, by golly, the best darn midget who ever played big league ball. He was also the only one. Due to his size, Gadel had worked as a riveter during World War II and was able to crawl inside the wings of airplanes. He was a professional performer, belonging to the American Guild of Variety Artists, AGVA. After the war, Gadel was hired in 1946 by Mercury Records as a mascot to portray the Mercury Man. He sported a wind hat similar to the record label's logo to promote Mercury recordings. Some early Mercury recordings featured a caricature of him as its logo. Brown's owner Bill Veek, a showman who enjoyed staging publicity stunts, found Gadel through a booking agency. Secretly signed by the Browns, he was added to the team roster and put in uniform, with the number 18 on the back. The uniform was that of current St. Louis Cardinals managing partner and chairman William DeWitt, Jr., who was a nine year old bat boy for the Browns at the time. Gadel came out of a papier-mâché cake between games of a doubleheader at Sportsman's Park in St. Louis to celebrate the American League's 50th anniversary. The stunt was also billed as a Falstaff Brewery promotion. Falstaff and the fans had been promised a festival of surprises by Veek. Before the second game got underway, the press agreed that the Mejid in a cake appearance had not been up to Veek's usual promotional standard. Falstaff personnel, who had been promised national publicity for their participation, were particularly dissatisfied. Keeping the surprise he had in store for the second game to himself, Veet just meekly apologized. Although Veet denied the stunt was directly inspired by it, the appearance of Gadel was unmistakably similar to the plot of You Could Look It Up, a 1941 short story by James Thurber. Veet later insisted he got the idea from listening to the conversations of Giants manager John McGraw decades earlier when Veet was a child. Gadel entered the second half of the doubleheader between the Browns and Detroit Tigers in the bottom of the first inning as a pinch hitter for leadoff batter Frank Saucier. Immediately, umpire Ed Hurley called for Browns manager Zach Taylor. Veek and Taylor had the foresight to have a copy of Gadel's contract on hand, as well as a copy of the Browns' active roster, which had room for Gadel's addition. The contract had been filed late in the day on Friday, August 17. Veek knew the league office would summarily approve the contract upon receipt and that it would not be scrutinized until Monday, August 20th. Upon reading the contract, Harley motioned for Gadel to take his place in the batter's box. As a result of Gadel's appearance, all contracts must now be approved by the Commissioner of Baseball before a player can appear in a game. The change to that day's St. Louis Browns scorecard, listing Gadel and his uniform number, had gone unnoticed by everyone except Harry Mutower, a writer for the St. Louis Globe Democrat. The Browns' publicity man shunted Mittower's inquiry aside. Gadel was under strict orders not to attempt to move the bat off his shoulder. When Veet got the impression that Gadel might be tempted to swing at a pitch, the owner warned Gadel that he had taken out a $1 million insurance policy on his life and that he would be standing on the roof of the stadium with a rifle prepared to kill Gadel if he even looked like he was going to swing. Veet had carefully trained Gadel to assume a tight crouch at the plate. He had measured Gadel's strike zone in that stance and claimed it was just one and a half inches high. However, when Gadel came to the plate, he abandoned the crouch he had been taught for a pose that Veet described as a fair approximation of Joe DiMaggio's classic style, leading Veet to fear he was going to swing. In the Thurber story, the player with dwarfism cannot resist swinging at a 3-0 pitch, grounds out, and the team loses the game. With Bob Kane on the mound, laughing at the absurdity that he actually had to pitch to Gadel and catcher Bob Swift catching on his knees, Gadel took his stance. The Tigers catcher offered his pitcher a piece of strategy, keep it low. Kane delivered four consecutive balls, all high, the first two pitches were legitimate attempts at strikes, the last two were half-speed tosses. 
Gable took his base, stopping twice during his trot to bow to the crowd, and was replaced by pinch runner Jim Del Singh. The 18,369 fans gave Gable a standing ovation. Viet had hoped that Del Singh would go on to score in a one run Browns victory, but he ended up stranded at third base and the Tigers went on to win the game 6 2. American League President Will Harridge, saying Veek was making a mockery of the game, voided Gatel's contract the next day. In response, Veek threatened to request an official ruling on whether Yankees shortstop and reigning American League MVP Phil Rizzuto, who stood 5 feet 6 inches, 1.68 m, was a short ball player or a tall dwarf. Initially, Major League Baseball struck Gatel from its record book, as if he had not been in the game. He was relisted a year later as a right-handed batter and left-handed thrower, although he did not play the field. Eddie Gatel finished his major league career with an on-base percentage of 1.000. His total earnings as a pro athlete were $100, the scale price for an AGVA appearance. However, he was able to parley his baseball fame into more than $17,000 by appearing on several television shows. Gatel's major league career lasted just the one plate appearance, but with Veek's 1959 acquisition of the White Sox, the native Chicagoan once again found some high-profile, albeit non-playing, ballpark employment. On May 26, 1959, a helicopter carrying Gatel and three other dwarfs dressed as spacemen invaded Comiskey Park, its apparent mission being the delivery of ray guns to two of the White Sox's smallest players, Nellie Fox and Luis Aparicio, to whom Gatel reportedly confided, I don't want to be taken to your leader. I've already met him. On April 19, 1961, Veek hired several dwarfs and midgets, including Gatel, as vendors, allegedly due to some complaints from fans regarding hitherto blocked sight lines. On June 18, 1961, the unemployed Gatel, who had just turned 36, was at a bowling alley in Chicago, his birthplace and hometown. Gatel was followed home and beaten. His mother discovered Eddie lying dead in his bed. He had bruises about his knees and on the left side of his face. A coroner's inquest determined that he also had suffered a heart attack. Bob Kane, who'd pitched to Gable, was the only Major League Baseball figure to attend the funeral. Gable was interred at St. Mary Catholic Cemetery and Mausoleum in Cook County, Illinois. Plot, Section G, Gravestone Number X363B. Gable is one of only five Major League players who drew a walk in their only play at appearance and never played the field. The first three all played in the 1910s, Dutch Skerrick, September 17, 1914 with the Browns, Bill Batch, September 9, 1916 with Pittsburgh, and Joe Cobb, April 25, 1918 with Detroit, although recent research shows that Cobb may have actually struck out in his only plate appearance. On June 24, 2007, Kevin Malello of the Oakland Athletics became the first player in over half a century to walk in his only plate appearance without taking the field against the New York Mets. Other than Gatel, the other four players pinched hit for pitchers, all five appeared in games their teams ultimately lost. Gatel's one-day career has been the subject of programs on ESPN and MLB Network. He was mentioned by name in the lyrics of Terry Cashman's homage to 1950s baseball, Talkin' Baseball, Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, Dot. His at-bag was the number one choice on a 1999 list of unusual and unforgettable moments in baseball history published by the Sporting News. In 1994, Veek's son Mike Veek owned the minor league St. Paul's Saints team. He brought the then 69-year-old Bob Kane to the park to reenact the act-bat by pitching to the 10-year-old son of the Saints manager. Due to its scarcity, Gatel's autograph now sells for more than Babe Ruth's. Gatel's grandnephew, Kyle Gadiel was drafted in the 32nd round by the Tampa Bay Rays in 2008 out of high school. The 6-foot 3-inch, 1.91M, Gadiel chose instead to attend Valparaiso University. He was selected in the June 2011 MLB draft by the San Diego Padres and he played minor league baseball as high as the AA level. He was released by the San Antonio Missions in 2015 and last played with Independent American Association's Chicago Dogs in 2018.